Welcome to Common Filth Radio, episode 11, brought to you by NPR. I don't know how anyone can tolerate that sound of a microphone being two centimeters away from somebody's mouth, but uh, apparently some people can, and those people usually have uh, government jobs. Anyway, for real, welcome to Common Filth Radio, episode 11. I've been gone a while of this, I am aware, but I will explain my absence briefly after some housekeeping. In the description of this video, you will find an Amazon affiliate link. You click on that, either open it in a new window or tab, and in that new window or tab, you do your search for the product you want to buy, add it to your cart, do the checkout all in that one tab, and um, yeah, you I get a um, I get a percentage of however much it costs you to buy. So it's much better than Patreon, I think, at this point because um, some people have asked me about, well, I want to support the show and you know, stuff like that, but I'm not comfortable with Patreon just yet, I'm waiting for them to uh, beef up their cybersecurity. Um, I don't want to get my identity stolen quite yet. So you can do your ordinary, normal, everyday Amazon purchases through that link and I get a cut of it and it would be greatly appreciated. Anyway, where have I been? I've been updating Twitter, um, a few of you follow me on there, I think I'm up to about 140 um, so I've been alive. I've been I've been nowhere out of the ordinary. I've learned that when you sit down to do this, you need to be in a certain place. You need to be in a certain frame of mind, and it's not something that I can easily turn on and turn off. I was feeling good for those two consecutive months, but I needed a break. Um, my my brain was just not on the level it needed to be. But here I am. I'm doing all right, and I'm ready to do this show. I have a lot of things to talk about. I've been taking notes over the past month and a half, and I'm about to share some of it with you. Of course, I will still answer your questions, so feel free to email me those at the same email address you are looking at now. You can also send me questions on Twitter. I'm uh, taking Twitter questions now. One of my planned subjects for this show was um, feminism as it relates to submissiveness and overcompensation and feelings of guilt um, for feeling naturally submissive, and um, Bulbasaur on the rightstuff.biz wrote an article about a woman who converted to Islam because she claims it appeals to her feminist ideals. I will not read the whole article, but I'm going to read a section of it which is pertinent to the argument I was going to make. If you'd like to read the whole thing yourself, I recommend it, and the link is down below. This woman's name is Teresa Corbin, and she is a white Muslim convert, and she converted some months after September 11th, 2001. Bulbasaur writes, Some have tried to argue that the what the author is doing here is embracing the strong horse of violent goat fuckers over the weak horse of modern Western society's decadence. They forget that feminism is not about utilizing patriarchal concepts like logic and agency. The fact of the matter is this woman did not convert to be strong but weak. She desires the perverse privilege of having no privilege. I would be comfortable wagering that if the United States were to become an Islamic state overnight, she would have a miraculous conversion almost as quickly. She does not write as a believer in Muhammad but in progressivism. She is not a Muslim. She is a demi. This is not about an afterlife but about getting attention in the present. It's not about faith or culture but identity politics. Corbin is too busy waxing relativistic and individualistic to notice that religion is concerned with an objective reality and things outside the self. Oopsie. This brings us to the following hilarious projection. She she says, It enrages me to know there are some who call themselves Muslim and who distort and misappropriate Islam for political gains. I agree with Bulbasaur that she's not a sincere believer in Prophet Muhammad, but... There is something else going on here which she says is not the case, which is she's going with the strong horse out of some kind of logical process, which she isn't, but I'm going to explain. I think this woman is simply going off of the natural impulse that most feminists have, which is to be dominated by something. And it's not about being dominated by men. They don't want that. They think that's a negative. They're taught that that's a negative. Rather, they want to be dominated by institutions. They do not want to submit to a man in their life who actually has some vested interest in her, like her being the mother of his children. No, family is patriarchal, highly oppressive, and possibly bigoted. 
And I know you're saying that a lot of feminists put on this tank girl persona, but it's really just a front. Look at somebody like Lacey Green who talks about getting fucked in the ass on YouTube videos. A woman who so openly admits to all this deviancy is somebody who is crying out for a very strong pimp hand. A strong, consistent pimp hand. Maybe not a literal slapping of the hoe, but um, somebody to keep her in check. Women crave authority and guidance. There is a complete void of that in the Western world. There is no masculinity. It has been outlawed. The only thing that you can really look to as an authority, a very dubious one, are institutions like academia or alternative religions in the case of Teresa Corbin. In Teresa Corbin's small, primitive, reproductive-driven brain, she knows that there will be no one to provide her with that pimp hand she so strongly desires. A conversion to a foreign religion like Islam, foreign with respect to language, those of us who speak Latin-based languages, those of us who think in Latin roots, it leads you to believe that there is just a complete void of patriarchal influence. I mean, literal patriarchal. Where was her father? Was she a daddy's girl? Was he always saying yes? Did he ever discipline her? Was he even around to do any of these things? She is clearly not getting that influence through her romantic life. She's, let's be frank here, she's not attractive. So, with no strong father, with no strong mate, where does she get put in her place? Where does that come from? It comes from institutions. And this is unfortunately the case in our culture. There are no strong men to make sure that everybody is maintaining their proper role. These wayward women put their eggs in the basket of these institutions like universities and Islam in her case. And these institutions have bad intentions. A disturbing question that pops up into my mind when assessing the situation is, does she have a choice? And I don't think that she really does. People are weak. People are imperfect. Therefore, they take the path of least resistance. Whatever path society makes that out to be. Those who subscribe to a belief system like feminism, as I've established, are probably the weakest among us. In the absence of masculinity, anywhere, this is what happens. The lady brain goes haywire. And of course this is a very extreme situation. Very few women, even feminists, will convert to Islam. Replace Islam with egalitarianism, and you have a very common story. And it's usually told by the women who attend university, who get four-year degrees. If we want these ladies to become converts to crazy ideas on a less frequent basis, we need to exercise our pimp hands a little more. I can attribute at least one week to lost productivity with regards to this show to being put in a bad mood by members of my generation who are in need of a good slapping from a strong pimp hand collectively. We all know that millennials are the biggest shitheads that have ever existed, so no dispute for me there, but I can advise them on how to become less shitty. To put this into some context, a lot of people have a catchphrase or something they repeat with slight variation that describes the general theme of what they do. I have things I repeat like dysgenic breeding, that's something I have said a lot in previous episodes, so people tend to repeat that back at me, usually in mockery. Mocking assholes. That's why I don't have any tagline or catchphrase that I say it. At the beginning of everything that I do, it would just make it too easy because at least I know that people are listening even if they don't like it. But um, the point is here, I was trying to make about millennials, comes from um, a semi-recent event that happened. I shared, uh, speaking of the right stuff.biz from one of their Facebook page. well, they only have one, their Facebook page on one of my pages, they posted a picture. And um, one of my followers asked, well, what's this right stuff biz? I said, like, they're the only website that matters, something to that extent. And they responded, uh, after only looking at the site's header, that it was try hard and stupid. Wow, such reactionary, so deep, blah, blah, blah. To the millennial not caring about anything except for 
sodomy and liberation from accountability is cool. Yet they cared enough to respond to the rotating sentences, sentences that appear at the top of this website, the right stuff.biz. This is an aside though, and it doesn't really have much to do with the main point, even though I probably said that, I don't remember. But the point is, is that millennials are highly dismissive. Like I said earlier, humans take the path of least resistance, at least most of us do. The path of least resistance is not something that's fixed. It changes as society changes. Go along to get along, in other words. This is why I say that humans are weak and imperfect, and most trends are just a manifestation of weakness and imperfection. To be dismissive is to take this path of least resistance. It requires no intellectual effort, as evidenced by the reaction that I talked about um, just a few seconds ago. The number one cause, the most important thing in the mind of all millennials is either institutionalized sodomy or feminism. Feminism or sodomy. It's either one or the other, and they're always one and two. Millennials are not given anything. They're not given free shit. They're not given any government cheese, goodies, grants, whatever you want to call it, for taking seriously disagreements with these causes like institutionalized sodomy. No one's given an X-rated parade for it, for disagreeing with it. No one's getting the backing of every major institution for it. Disagreement, that is. No one gets a favorable grade on their papers for it. There's no incentive to go against these trends. The incentive is what ultimately creates the path of least resistance. Now that I've established this, what incentive do people have for being dismissive? Well, amongst other things, the incentive for being dismissive is pure, pure approval. We live in a very gotcha phase of culture, where the person who can be the most mean-spirited, the shittiest, is rewarded. We also reward those who can point out some apparent contradiction in the behavior of a given person, provided that behavior is removed from any situational context. People who explain themselves cannot do so in the character limit which Twitter allows. People who explain themselves do not get featured in, I don't know, the trending topics on Facebook or Twitter, or on BuzzFeed, or any of its offshoots. The people who are dismissive towards those who explain themselves get all the attention. Like Jon Stewart, his entire career is based off of this. The peer approval incentive is not just in dismissiveness, but it's also in these bizarre appeals to sophistication. What is that? It's basically the primary argument by the average person, the dullard who thinks that school makes them educated, not realizing that they aren't educated, but they are compliant. They are submissive. It's not education. They don't know anything. I encounter this appeal quite often on Tumblristas, the page I run. It's usually by some idiot telling me that body dysmorphia is a real thing, and then I'm dumb for not realizing that. And I'm dumb for not realizing the cure for it is gender reassignment surgery. It's like telling a schizophrenic that, oh, you're ill, but we're going to, that, that thing you're talking to over in the corner there that we can't see, we're going to put a mannequin over there. That'll make it real. That will be a viable political platform in a, give it like 10 or 20 years. It'll be like, oh, taxpayer subsidized mannequins for every crazy person that drinks soy sauce in the Piggly Wiggly parking lot. We can embrace neurodiversity then. And at this point, you're probably wondering, what the fuck? I thought you answered our questions. Don't worry, I'm getting there. Because any question should I answer first? Let's go with Kyle's. I found a communist manifesto in my grandfather's belongings after we moved him into a retirement home. What should I do about this? Well, I downloaded an audiobook of the communist manifesto and I couldn't listen to 10 minutes of it. It's unlistenable shit. If more people read Mein Kampf instead of the Communist Manifesto or read them side by side, we'd have a lot more Nazis running around because Adolf Hitler was a far better writer than Karl Marx. Just awful. It's like only the craziest people could ever find any 
nugget of truth in, well, whatever they deemed to be truth in the Communist Manifesto. I knew a, uh, I knew a Marxist, um, he, he's a published author, he has children, he's divorced now, um, for obvious reasons. Um, I read some interview, like how he want, he thinks he wants to have a sex change, but he thinks God's more complicated than that, and it's just moving around parts, but he identifies as a woman to some extent because he wrote a book about himself getting fucked by men and women because he liked to change genders. It's really bizarre. And on the crazy Marxist spectrum, that's probably pretty light. Look what Pol Pot did. And that was probably the purest implementation of Marxism you could possibly imagine. But it's not about that. This is about Kyle's grandpa. And I don't think you should um, make any big deal out of it. It would be interesting to uh, hear about why he has it um, if he's if he's there mentally. He was probably um, young enough or old enough to understand the hubbub and be curious enough to uh, look into it, the, the controversy surrounding communism. So, like in my case, it was just basic curiosity, but it soon disappeared due to how fucking boring it was. That's about all I have to say on the subject, but best wishes to your grandpa. I hope he, uh, hope he's doing all right. Next one is from Josh. Hello, I've been listening to the show for a while, and I've been wondering what your opinion on the European New Right is, because generally I'd say you and their beliefs line up pretty close in areas related to anti-egalitarianism, but differ widely on Christianity. Thanks for keeping the show around. I really enjoy it and can't wait for more episodes. I think the European New Right should familiarize themselves not with the pussy brand of Christianity, but the brand of Christianity where Jesus would beat the shit out of people with ropes. My Lord and Savior is no pussy. I find it funny how the less white the white people are in Europe, the more proud they are of their culture, the stronger they are as a culture, the stronger sense of preservation they have towards their culture. The Spaniards, however, are um, complicating that notion I have due to how pussified they're becoming. So I guess I the only ones I like are the Italians and uh, the Greeks to some extent, even though they're a fucking mess. I haven't heard much about them recently, to be honest, but they have Golden Dawn, and um, I don't think that there's uh, there's much else like that in the Nordic sphere. I read recently that um, Russia's fucking with Sweden, and I would love nothing more than the uh, the Russians to invade, because that would just be hilarious. I bet you Sweden has a military of like a thousand people, if they have one at all. They're going to get rolled. Alright, next one is from David. It's kind of long, but I'll read it. I have started listening to your YouTube thing while I have free time and I like the show and we seem to have very similar views where I was raised as a Christian, stopped caring about anything through my edgy teen years and grew to be a libertarian, although I wasn't a good one. I was still for closed borders and non-free trade, traditional sex roles, fuck using the gender word, it doesn't even relate to biology or society anyway, and am now for some freedoms, however I'm much harder on drug policy and I was always biased against anyone who drank alcohol, let alone anyone who did weed. But I always thought libertarianism was about the freedom to hate drug users, too. Uh, now I am back to being a full traditionalist, especially because of Peter Hitchens, convincing arguments and actually going to university after working in a sand yard for a year made me dislike those who take everything too far. Anyway, my question relates to King of the Hill, where you said it was the best show ever. I agree. What would you say your favorite episode is? My two favorite that I can remember off the top of my head are the one where some Twiggy was trying to take Bobby away from Hank because Hank was a proper parent who didn't take crap in any episode where it's mostly Dale in the show just because he's such a well-written character. Thank you, David. I think a lot of people, um, even people who don't talk about it, have undergone some similar development. Um, like Charles Bukowski said, marijuana cuts off all spirit. If you're around potheads, that statement is completely affirmed. I think that libertarians are generally intelligent people, but the problem is most people aren't intelligent, and most people need to be intelligent. Basically everybody, in order for a libertarian society to work, it's just not possible. Or maybe I'm wrong about them being intelligent. Um, Ron Paul did retire two years ago, so... 
It seems to have taken a nosedive since his departure. For my favorite King of the Hill episode, I um I can't name you one that I watch all the time, but one that uh, I remember pretty vividly is the one where Bobby gets involved with this cool bro church, Jesus as your buddy kind of church, where Hank tells the guy, you're not making rock and roll better, you're making Christianity worse, something to that extent. And I thought the message of the episode was, was it hit home a bit. But thank you for telling your uh, story, David. Um, I'm not a uh, traditionalist. I don't put that label on myself, even though I have very traditionalist sympathies. I, I don't reject all labels, but um, I embrace very few of them, if any. Gamergate's still going on, apparently. I don't know how they have the, uh, the stamina to keep going with that, but... Somebody asked me about it all the way in the Zoe, Zoe Quinn, however you pronounce that, um, pronounce that name. Somebody asked me a long time ago, back in late August, about it, and it's just been taking twists and turns. It's, I've been trying to keep up on it, but it's just, if you're not actively in the trenches with that, you might as well just wait till it's all over and read about it or hear, hear about it from somebody. But if you're a pro gamer gate and you're involved with it every day, you're ruffling some gawker feathers. Those are good feathers to ruffle. I uh, I support you. Fuck gawker, but not fuck Deanington, who is asking this question. In episode nine, you said that we need a war because due to unchecked prosperity, we have become weak. I do agree with you, but as my country becomes more of a multicultural hellhole with a government which believes that importing more third worlders for cheap labor and can continues to pass anti-terrorism laws to spy on me, so naturally I don't want to fight for my country, let alone die defending it. How can I morally, righteously expect anyone else to do the same when, as far as I'm concerned, my country and government can go rot? Killy D1994 on YouTube asked, um, is patriotism important? And I think these two questions fit together in a nice way. I am a stranger in a strange land myself. I do not identify with what most of what America is doing and what Americans are becoming. What used to be us is now them. And there are very few people that I would say us. We. Uh, as in me and other people. So, no, I would not fight for the protections of people who live in large coastal cities as um, many farm boys from Arkansas are doing right now over in various uh, Middle Eastern locales and African locales with the uh, advent of Ebola resurgence. I think that War from not an external threat, but an internal one is what is necessary for most Western nations. They need to be split apart into ideological factions. I take this position because my technical fellow countrymen are people like New Yorkers or like in Connecticut and Vermont, which are basically like Sweden of America. There's no way in hell that I'm going to do anything for those people. I'd much rather do something for the potato farmer in Idaho. So this, by definition, would not make me a patriot. America is too large for patriotism to be possible or have any sort of meaning. So my advice is to find a couple hundred people, a couple thousand people, grow that to a couple of 10,000 people, 100,000 people, and make it so that that's who you consider from your perspective, us or we should define your perimeter, put up a flag, this is ours, make your statement, and start getting shit done. Obviously, that's very idealistic and probably not possible within um, any of our lifetimes, but it, it does establish how I feel about um, fighting for your country when your country um, it has nothing to do with who you are or what you hold to be valuable. I would not advise anyone under any circumstances to join the military or fight for a nation that is spiritually, morally dead. The only thing that we can do is make our piece of land more virtuous, more noble, or we start our own community and grow it that we find virtuous and noble. Next question is from Shea. 
I'd love to hear your opinion on genetically modified organisms. Do you believe they have a purpose or potential to feed more people? Or do you think it's mad science that has the potential to be dangerous? I'm not going to address any of the potential dangers or um, potential health effects they have on people because they're so new to the uh, food chain that we really have no idea yet. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it led to some negative consequences, but I'm going to withhold judgment um, with respect to that issue. However, I think that feeding people a more massive amount of people is actually a bad thing because it's always used in some multicultural frame like look we could feed starving africans well they wouldn't be having these babies if we weren't giving them aid in the first place listen i get it starvation is a terrible awful thing but you cannot starve if you do not exist existence cannot happen without conception and all this aid is doing is encouraging people to breed when they should not people don't want any unpleasantness and this is the problem there must be suffering or else nothing can get accomplished. If everything is awesome all of the time, then what is being accomplished? Like I said, happiness is the enemy. I wrote this at some point. Happiness should not be the end in and of itself. It should be a byproduct of productive behavior. And simply increasing the population for the sake of increasing the population is not something that I'd call productive. So, for their greater ability to feed people, I am against genetically modified organisms. Just because we could put the entire population of Earth in Texas and have like the population density of Paris doesn't mean we should. People are not meant to live on top of one another. It is not a healthy way to be. I know that overpopulation isn't a problem in white countries, but in the rest of the world it is. So, um, yeah we need to be discouraging rather than encouraging population growth. Another thought-provoking question from Snoopy at the Facebook page. Check out Snoopy on Facebook. I once saw the amazing atheist uh, somehow correlate the dropping attendance of the Catholic Church with the slight rise of people identifying as atheist in censuses. Do you agree with that proposal? I don't think people are going, oh, I don't suddenly believe in God anymore. I'll be atheist. I think church attendance is dropping because of our modern day 24 hour society where we don't have the time to go to church on Sunday because we have to work. I also think recent revelations about institutionalized child abuse by religious orders like the Catholic Church, the Church of England, and Judaism is causing a distrust in these organizations. Faith itself isn't dropping. I think many people still believe in God in some form. I know from seeing the Royal Commission into Child Abuse here in Australia has made me less trusting of the people who claim to represent God. Long read, I know, but I do like that your show is so thought-provoking. Not a lot of places these days allow you to speak freely even if it's not 100% politically correct with today's pro-left mainstream media. The people who are identifying as atheists um, more recently are probably people that never would have attended church in the first place, so I don't see the Catholic Church uh, affecting rates of faith uh, too much. I know some former Catholics, and some of them don't really believe anymore, but most of them um, have moved on to other congregations. So, yeah, I don't see, I don't see his um, reasoning holding up there. It's also a function of atheism becoming, a, um, becoming more of a belief in and of itself. Um, some people have made the argument that atheism is just an offshoot of Christianity, just like um, Protestantism is a reaction against Catholicism. If somebody truly has no belief in God, they don't use God to make arguments like the atheists do. They say, well, the Bible does this, so why don't you do that? I know more about the Bible than you do. Well, motherfucker, if you don't believe in it, then why are you fucking reading it? Why are you using it as a means to win an argument if it's not real, if it's all invalid, if it's all just, oh, there's a invisible man in the sky, it's just adult fairy tales. There's a token dismissive millennial argument. Most people who are church going and who believe in God aren't going to have that belief impacted too much by the actions of man, even if they are on the behalf of what they claim to be God. Because these things clearly are not godly. We know that intuitively. I've seen those horrific rabbi circumcision pictures and 
many people have likely seen them, but I don't think anybody has seen them and said, this happened, therefore God doesn't exist. It's just not reasonable. I agree with you that society is becoming more around-the-clock materialistic, and people tend to go away from spiritual things when they're distracted by shiny objects like money and the things that can be bought with it. I remember reading an article about Sylvester Stallone, who is a Catholic, and with the success he saw in Rocky, he got a lot of money from that, and he said he was very seduced by all of it, and then his child got sick, and because of that, he was brought back into the fold of, of paying more attention to his uh, spirituality. No one wants to have that come down back to reality after having some success. They just want the good times to last forever without taking a step back and reassessing everything, making sure everything's okay and looking to God for guidance. I think people are being more drawn to atheism because of that. It doesn't it doesn't provide you with any grounding. It doesn't provide you with any reassessment of what's really important in life. There's nobody to answer to, so just live it up all the time, and it's, it's very unhealthy. I got another question about the Westboro Baptist Church from Sean. I didn't even know they were still relevant after, um, hell, even before Fred Phelps died, they were kind of on the, on the downswing, but... From Sean, your views on the Westboro Baptist Church. I used to see them as an extremist group until I realized at any other point in history except ours, their acts would be acceptable. I know I wrote about this um, some time ago, um, infamously saying I have my sympathies towards them. But honestly, it is it is a matter of they're the only people against what they're against. And as insane as they are, it, it speaks volumes to the cowardice uh, in our culture. They're the only ones who say that the military isn't something to be celebrated because it is. They defend our freedoms. When, when was the last time they defended any freedom? Other than, oh look, we shot some Muslims. That defended our freedom. No, if they were really defending our freedom, they'd be doing some shit that I couldn't say uh, lest I be arrested. Look, I have a lot of respect for individual soldiers, but as a whole, I just don't like the institution the military has become in the United States. So I listened to a few of the previous episodes. I don't remember which one, but I explained um, pretty early on in one of the episodes, if I recall correctly, that I, I elaborate on um, what I said on the website some months ago. Okay, next question from Vincent. I was talking to a friend, and I use that term extremely lightly, and she was talking about how much she hated her dad. Why do kids nowadays hate their parents so much? I know there's the whole teenage rebellion thing, but it seems to go to much further than that, even condemning their own parents. What is your opinion on this whole matter? The problem is that kids have no sense of morality or ethics or anything to make these judgments. They just have their own whims and impulses that they think should be fulfilled because they feel them and they feel good and nobody should say no because everything should be great all of the time. So the first true tastes of discipline and the first few false thoughts in the teenage brain or however old they are that they should be independent and they're their own person. It There is bound to be a conflict, but given good parenting techniques, the conflict should last not very long, but your quote-unquote friend probably does hate her dad because her dad's probably a decent person. Moral inversion can be found everywhere, and teenagers are no exception. Look, look who the greatest critic of Judaism is in Western culture right now. It's Brother Nathaniel, who is Jewish. The only guy writing books about masculinity, Jack Donovan, is an open homosexual. It's we live in very strange times. So if her dad's uh, pimp hand is strong, she will uh, soon learn the ways of keeping quiet and not airing her dirty laundry. Everyone wants to be a victim these days. It's the cool thing to do. It's because victimhood is a void. Something is being done to you. Something is being taken from you. And we tend to notice the things that are missing rather than the things that are there and... Unfortunately, victimhood gets you credit somehow. 
It's like fucking Anita Sarkeesian bitching about the patriarchy because some guys like to see women in bikinis and that's bad because that's the patriarchy and all this kind of circular logic. You know, not everybody wants to rape you. The rape is coming from inside your brain. Projection and solipsism. Look them up. During the hiatus, I was listening back to a few of my episodes and um, I did spot a contradiction. Um, not in the same episode, but between episodes. Um, I don't remember which one. I don't keep I don't keep a list of what I said for each episode. That would strike me as highly narcissistic. But I said that people can rise above the means which contain themselves. And I've also said that people can't rise above the means which contain themselves. Which do I believe and what do I mean by this? Well, I believe both of them. Unfortunately, most people are not capable of rising above the means which contain them. And what are the means which contain them? Well, ability, intelligence, um, just impulses in general. The means which contain people can be biological, and that's mostly what we're talking about, but they can also be societal and cultural, like several Division I football programs openly uh, saying that they won't recruit certain positions if the people who hold those positions are white. Um, regardless of their production in high school. But we're here to talk about questions, not that. And we're going to talk about Pendrake113's questions um, from YouTube. I have a question about your views of the separation between animals and humans. In the, this video, you seem to describe empathy as a major factor of that separation. How do you interpret animals who seem to adopt animals of different species and raise them either along with or independent of their own young? Gorilla with the kitten, cat with the bunny, diverse examples abound. Empathy is certainly a major distinction, and that's not to say that animals don't have empathy, but civilization is a much bigger one, even though I've said elephants are capable of some level of civilization. It's it's not, not impressive compared to what humans have achieved, but not to deny the achievements of elephants, whatever those may be. But, um, yeah, empathy... Uh, is, is probably just a simple maternal instinct um, manifesting itself in these creatures. Um, even though the young they're caring for do not match their natural young. A lot of creatures um, don't have self-awareness. Um, they've done testing with this where they don't recognize their own reflection in a mirror. Like I remember watching a clip of an octopus attacking a mirror that it saw itself in. And octop the octopus is a, um, is a very intelligent creature and it still doesn't recognize its own reflection. So it doesn't surprise me that dogs look at cats and say, yeah, that's an ugly looking dog. Oh, well, I'll take care of it. Next question from Michael. What are your views on abortion given that America and the world for that matter suffers from problems such as overpopulation and dysgenic breeding, that we routinely exterminate organisms far more developed than early stage fetuses, dogs, death row inmates, etc., that putting it up for adoption tends to result in a horrible childhood full of bounces between abusive foster homes. I could take the born-again Christian view on this and said every life is precious, therefore we should do it, and I believe that to some extent. I believe that people um, should have the chance to fight through whatever adversity um, they may face and achieve something greater than what they started out as. But the problem with accepting mercy killings um, as a means of avoiding a life of hardship, it leads to a slippery slope. I know that's a fallacy, but really the same people that tell you that slippery slope is a fallacy are the same people that tell you that the Overton window is legitimate political science theory. First you allow abortions, then euthanasia, and then euthanasia is for some depressed teenager goes into a hospital, oh, I don't want to live anymore. Well, all right then, you know, that's just ridiculous. We don't want that to happen, and I would not be surprised if it did happen given the acceptance of other forms of it. I think it's odd that a lot of people are pro-abortion but are against suicide for some reason. It's strange to me. But with regard to abortion, um, in America, yeah, there are a lot of shitty foster parents, but you also have a lot of affluent people who wait too late in life to have children that passes them by and the only way that they could have children 
healthy children is through adoption. So even though that environment might not be ideal in some respect, it's a hell of a lot better than abusive foster homes like you described. And I think that there should be more of an effort to find those affluent um, older people and and putting children um, in those kinds of homes. This one's from Edgy Yam Yams. I don't like to say that, but that's the name that's given. Would the Protestant church benefit from not having congregations, or is it better off separated? Also, what do you think has caused the recent skyrocketing of mental illness in children and adolescents? Honestly, um, I was never brought up in any, um, it's like non-denominational Christian. It's implicitly Protestant, but not affiliated with anybody. But um, I'm against any kind of unification where unification is not appropriate because somebody's wrong somewhere. And if you're compromising, then everybody's wrong. The politics of the Christian church, especially in the modern age, doesn't fascinate me terribly. So that's about all I can say on that. With regard to your comment about uh, mental illnesses being more prevalent in children and adolescents, I think it's simply... Oh, sorry about that train sound if you heard it. Um, I live near some trains. All right, now that that's over. Um, people are sending their kids to school and letting the school administrators have far too much influence over the lives of their children with regard to medication. Boys will act like boys, and no, I don't mean that in some rapey kind of way like all these fucking ads on TV right now, but as in a rowdy, aggressive kind of way. Not in a damaging kind of way, but, you know, just boys getting out their natural aggression. And most school employees, public school employees, public school district employees are women. And these are people who don't usually don't have children themselves, don't have sons themselves, so they don't know how to deal with them. So how do they deal with them? Well, there must be something wrong with them. They aren't being compliant. They aren't being submissive. We must medicate them. And they're usually putting them on these antidepressants, which, as we know, have a strong connection to uh, school shootings that have happened um, throughout the years. That Sarkeesian last um, responded to the most recent school shooting up in uh, Washington by saying that it's toxic masculinity's fault. I'd actually argue that it's toxic femininity's fault that these boys are snapping and lashing out. Next question is from Ouija010, or is it just 10? Should the United States delete God from all newly minted currency and the Pledge of Allegiance? We're not a Christian nation anymore, and it's awkward being a non-adherent saying one nation under God at the beginning of the day. Every day and using currency that explicitly states in God we trust. I would really like your take on this if you have one. Well, look, we haven't been a Christian nation, but we've always been a theistic nation. It doesn't say in Christ we tr trust. There's God means many things to many people, and... Um, the Constitution does state that Congress will make no religion, um, no state religion, and it will not prevent anyone from practicing their religion. So you can believe in God however you see fit here. Um, that is what it says. And if your God is not a, a spiritual being, then your God is some physical being, be it man or yourself or Mother Gaia, if you're of that persuasion but you know you're 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 serving somebody and that somebody is always god even if it is a false god all right last question from frank the tank os on youtube do you ever plan on having guests or interviews on the podcast yes but um i'm not sure when and it's it's hard to arrange time especially if you're in different time zones and you have your spots of free time in different places but I'd like to have uh, my friend Local M on. I'd like to have Sam Hyde on, even though he's busy. Um, and I don't really know him, but that's like, he's like the ace of spades on my list. I'd really like to have him on. And there's some cool people on Twitter that have um, that have said, hey, you should have some people from the Neo Reactionary on. And I certainly like a lot of those people. Um, the Reactionary Tree, Anti-Democracy blog, they've all... They've all been really enthusiastic about the work I do on this show, and um, I definitely appreciate that. All right, so we're going to try to make this a weekly thing again, so inundate me with your emails at commonfilth at commonfilth.com. I will 
be sure to respond or you could get in touch with me on my Facebook pages. Um, you know the ones. And um, that's about it. Uh, thank you for listening. It's good to be back and I'll see you next week.